Welcome everybody to the our first meeting of the Critical Antiquities Workshop for the second half of 2022. It's wonderful to see you here and we're very excited for this book launch. Uh, I first want to acknowledge the country on which the meeting is taking place. Uh, all of us uh, in the meeting are scattered across Australia and the world. So there are lots of countries that could be acknowledged, but um, for the sake of getting to the book, I might limit it um, to just one or two. So uh, Ben and I um, want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the University of Sydney and the University of Wollongong are based. So we acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the custodians of the land on which the University of Sydney is situated. And we acknowledge the Darawal, Yuin and Wadi Wadi peoples as the traditional custodians of country in the Illawarra, where the University of Wollongong is located. And we pay respect to our elders past, present and emerging. So uh, like I said, we're very excited to have um, Edgar Garcia here today for uh, a launch of uh, Emergency, reading the Popovar in a time of crisis. Uh, and I'll just start by um, introducing um, Edgar. Um, uh, but before I do so, I'll give you a quick heads up about the, the format for today. Uh, so um, uh, we'll first hear from uh, Edgar, who's gonna give us um, a bit of a spiel about uh, the book, uh, what motivated him, what it's about, um, that kind of thing. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Robin Rod, the first of our two discussants. Um, uh, after that, we'll hear from Ignacio Car Carvajal, and he will be um, uh, speaking for a few minutes as well. Uh, then we'll give a chance to uh, Edgar to respond um, to the discussants. Uh, and after that, we'll open it up uh, to more general um, question and answer. Okay, so uh, let me introduce um, Edgar. Edgar Garcia is Associate Professor of English at the University of Chicago, where he's been based since uh, 2015, after finishing his PhD at Yale University in the same year. Uh, Edgar is a poet and a scholar of the hemispheric cultures of the Americas. In terms of disciplinary fields, his work is situated within Indigenous and Latinx studies, American poetry and poetics, environmental criticism, theory of law, and the intersection of poetry and anthropology. He's particularly interested in investigating the ways that semiotics and aesthetics serve as an interface for racial and national social locations. And in doing so, he focuses on literatures and cultural practices that aren't usually taken seriously as literature or as culture. So the contemporary literature, visual art, legal philosophy and environmental thinking of non-alphabetic sign systems, such as pictographs and kipu, as well as dreams, practices, and textual formations of divination and magic. Sounds like a wonderful field of research to do, by the way. Uh, to that end, he's published numerous articles and books. Uh, his work has appeared in such venues as publications of the Modern Language Association, uh, Modern Philo Philology, the Chron Chronicle of High Higher Education, Portable Gray, and Fence, where he's currently also uh, an editor. Uh, his first book, Signs of the Americas, A Poetics of Pictography, Hieroglyphs and Kipu, University of Chicago Press 2020, addresses the indigenous sign systems such as pictographs, petroglyphs, hieroglyphs and kipu, I hope I'm pronouncing kipu right by the way, um, uh, that are usually seen as just relics from an inaccessible past. But in his book, Edgar argues that rather than being dead languages, these sign systems have always been living evolving signifiers, responsive to their circumstances and able to continuously redefine themselves and the nature of the world. And so, of course, you can see the parallels between that work and uh, the book that we're going to be um, talking about today, which I hope you've had a chance to read. Um, so this second book now uh, is, is Emergency, Reading the Popple Vi in a Time of Crisis. And I won't bother summarising the book, of course, because we have the man himself to do that for us. So uh, let me hand it over to Edgar and um, he'll talk for a few minutes about it and then we'll hear from our discussant. So please join me uh, everyone in thanking uh, Edgar Garcia for generously sharing his work and his time with us today. Thank you so much, Tristan, that was very generous. And thank you to you and to Ben for having me and to Ignacio and Robin for uh, uh, coming here to be respondents today. And then for everybody uh, who is here to join in the uh, conversation. Uh, I think you did an amazing job of summarizing uh, my work, um, of, of, of situating the book in a larger arc 
of uh, taking seriously um, the literatures and cultures that for historical and social reasons, i.e. racism, tend not to be taken seriously as either literature uh, or culture. My work has been invested in amplifying the seriousness, the presence of um, uh, the literatures of the Americas. And uh, one further way that I have come to think about it, um, 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 that this book, that the writing of this book helped me to see what it is that I'm doing, uh, is um, trying to understand the relationship between the relation between uh, crisis and creativity, right? um, uh, trying to understand uh, scenes of apparent victimhood as more than only victimhood, as different than only victimhood, and as, you know, um, uh, implicated in um, moments of world creation. Uh, how does this uh, uh, Kiche Mayan story of creation um, 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 get entangled with this idea? Uh, well, for starters, and here I'm going to kind of give an overview of what is the Popo Vu, uh, where in time it comes from, and um, um, what its relation to history um, and, and creation stories uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, for starters, uh, the Popo Vu that we have today, uh, this Kichin Maya story of creation, um, the physical copy, the only extant copy, uh, uh, was transcribed in 1702 uh, in the Guatemalan highlands in a, a scene of absolute colonial um, uh, violence. Um, um, it was produced um, because of the efforts of a uh, colonial friar, uh, Francisco Jimenez, uh, who asked his Maya informants uh, to um, tell their creation story so that he might transcribe it and enclose it in a manual for conversion. Right? The Popol Vu, as we receive it today, it was originally bound in a four-part manual of conversion. Right? The, the first part was a grammar of three Maya languages. The second part Part was uh, the art of evangelization. The third part is the text of the Popol Vuh. Uh, and then the fourth part is a commentary, a scolios by this guy, Francisco Jimenez, which are basically saying, don't get it twisted, right? The, these, these works are devilish or dumb, right? They're, they're like, don't, you know, um, 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 don't take this at face value. Uh, so from the outset, this work, the story of creation, uh, which we know uh, goes back to at least the 1550s in some earlier non-extant version because of the um, end of the Popol Vuh, the end of the text, which ends with a, a list, a lineage of Maya kings, uh, uh, which we can date, right, ending in the 1550s, so we can kind of retroprojectively date the text of the Popol Vuh in the 1702 version to sometime, to, to, to an earlier text that was transcribed sometime in the 1550s. And then we can also be indicated, uh, uh, stories from the Popo can also be indicated found in the Maya stelas of Mesoamerica. And you see the stories of the Popo Vu depicted in non-alphabetical ways throughout Mesoamerica. So we know that the story is very old. Uh, we know that it has um, pre-Columbian um, 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 uh, origins, uh, but for all intents and purposes, what we receive of the Popol Vuh, what text we have here, in fact, in Chicago at the Newberry Library, where it ended up after several colonial transmissions, what we have is a highly colonial text. Right? Uh, it's a story of creation that arrives in colonial formation. And uh, uh, what animates me, what fascinates me, what in fact inspired me to write this book was that the book knows that. Right, the authors in the book are responding to that very situation. In its opening pages, they say, "Here, in the times of teaching of Christ, here in Christendom, we will bring light out of the eastern sky. We will bring the world into existence." Right, that is a a, a very interesting, fascinating, and inspiring uh, conception of creation for me because it is not creation from primordial darkness. It is creation from colonial darkness. Uh, it is creation from history. Right? Uh, it is a creation story that emphatically situates itself um, um, in crisis. Okay, so what is this creation story? Right? We all kind of probably have some imagination of what a creation story is. Uh, the Popol Vuh is a kind of strange creation story. Well, one, because it situates itself emphatically in colonialism as the darkness from which it will bring uh, the sun into existence, but also because it delays creation until its final pages. Right? Uh, for the most of the book, 
You are in darkness and everybody is working to bring the people into existence who will then bring the sun into existence. So the entire book is in this kind of penumbra, in this uh, um, uh, aperon, right? uh, in this kind of scene of anticipation. It's dark. It's muddy. It's muddy because the sun hasn't come out to bake and harden the world into existence. Everything is kind of mushy and wet and dark. And there are all these failed creations. The gods first try to make um, uh, animals, right? The animals are their first attempt, but the animals are uh, too perfect in a number of ways, as I uh, sort of describe in the first chapter. Then they try with the mud people, people made out of mud, but the mud people are made of sod and mush. And so their mouths can't form the right words. And, um, uh, and then they try with the wood people, but the wood people are too stiff, too hollow. Um, the wood people create civilizations. They uh, expand over all the earth, but ultimately the gods are dissatisfied and they let the wood people be destroyed. Uh, then hard break, hard cinematic break in the creation story. There's an underworld descent. There's a couple of hero twins, uh, Shpalenk and Hunapu, who have to descend into the underworld to find the flesh substance, right, to acquire the flesh substance, uh, the kind of catabasis to acquire inner necessity, inner necessity uh, which ultimately is maize, right? They come out with maize, and maize is the flesh substance of humans, right? It's the thing by which humans um, um, can understand their inner necessity, what they are on earth for. It's not ball games, it's not courtly politics, it's not conquest, it's not this or that. Um, it's, 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 um, um, uh, necessary food. Um, humans are then made, right? and then these humans that are made, this is, we're, this, we're like 200 pages in the book right now, right? and then humans are finally made, uh, and they have to go on a series of migrations, right? and then they go on this series of migrations where they have various foibles and failures until finally they get it, right? They get the, the right way of making poetry, the right way of speaking their praise to the gods, um, and the sun finally comes into existence in you know, towards the end um, uh, of the book. And then, you know, slowly the book begins to leave what we might call mythical history and enter historical history, um, um, uh, culminating in that lineage of kings at its um, uh, uh, very uh, end. Um, um, uh, for me, these these topics, creation and colonialism, delayed suspension, um, uh, divine ambivalence, because the gods don't know how to do it and they don't know if they should do it, uh, repetition and recursivity. Um, unlike uh, Greco-Roman epic, uh, there's no bifurcation of decision in the book. So like, you know, Greco-Roman epic, which, which you all are familiar, if a hero makes a decision, the consequences of that decision cascade for all history, right? It's just, you know, a bad choice somewhere in the past and cascaded for all uh, um, uh, uh, the future line of that hero. In the Popo Vu, people come back to scenes of decision. There's this recursivity, this repetition, there's a chance to uh, revise uh, the creation. Um, 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 and also this idea of the use of instruments, right? the Popo Vu calls itself an instrument for seeing, for seeing clearly, Ilba al Sak um, um, uh, came to a head for me during the pandemic when I was stuck at home um, uh, in the lockdown in a scene of uh, 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 what came to feel like terrible stillness. And so now I'm telling you, well, why did I write this book? Right? Um, 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 as you all uh, will remember, um, and I think that maybe you all in Australia had it even harder and rougher in terms of the lockdown than we did. I don't know. I don't know where you're at. I tried to tell this uh, uh, anecdote in Miami and people are like, what the fuck are you talking about? We didn't have a lockdown. You know? um, um, you know, it's not everybody had. It. So, so did it, this doesn't always hit, but I think for you it may. Uh, that, that stillness um, of, of, of a scene before creation right, um, isn't always peaceful. Right? Uh, that stillness can also be terrifying. That stillness can be filled with dread. Uh, that stillness can be filled at that you know moment before a thing is made can be you know scary and dangerous. Um, resonated for me during the lockdown when you know people were talking about other pandemic literatures and they were talking about the Decameron and whatnot. And I started thinking, well, what about like the Florentine Codex, right? What about the Popol Vuh, uh, works of pandemic literature right? written during like terrific epidemiological crisis? I mean, 90% of the people in this hemisphere died right? and that the diseases wouldn't have spread as widely, as devastatingly, as intensely if those people weren't actually 
as interconnected and as you know many um, 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 as you know as to be vectors for a hemisphere-wide disease. That is to say, if there were local groups in separated little places, uh, you know, the, the diseases of the Americas would not have spread um, uh, throughout the uh, whole hemisphere. But um, um, the evidence of their spread, or the evidence of those massive populations, can be seen in the rapidity uh, of the spread. Uh, you know, i.e., Mexico City didn't achieve its population levels until. Uh, pre-Columbian population levels until the 1970s, which is a fact. Right? Massive amounts of people, right? True, devastating epidemiological crisis. The the the, the terrific um, potency, right? Presence of stillness um, felt to me very palpable, and and even just in a touch, right? Even just in a taste of what it must have felt like for the authors of the Popol Vuh writing in 1702, in the stillness of epidemiological crisis, in the hiding of the of of of, of you know of political and social endangerment um, uh, in a world that you know uh, you know had collapsed for all intents and purposes. They still, they still made a creation story. That to me is phenomenal, right? That, that's when you think of creation stories, right? In, in, in terrific emergency, in tremendous crisis, that that's when you turn to creation stories. Um, to me, it was very powerful. And so I turned to the Popol Vuh uh, at that time um, in that way uh, uh, for those uh, reasons. I had just taught a class on the Popol Vuh. So it happened that all of my books were at home. As you all remember, we just kind of got stuck with the books we had. And so it was like very, um, I, I felt motivated. And um, um, a colleague of mine, Mark Payne, uh, who some of you may know, and you may also know Brooke Holmes, uh, 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 co-editors of the series, Critical Antiquities, happens to have the same name as this uh, network, um, 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 asked me, do you know, do you have that Popol Vuh book in you? And I said, yes, I think I do, but I want it to be a collection of essays. Right? Um, and, and the essay form uh, was important for me uh, for um, 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 uh, dramatizing uh, a relationship to the text that is internal to the text. Right? I didn't want to perform um, 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 uh, expert objectivity. I wanted to take the text seriously as an object for seeing and look with the text, right? Not look at the text, but really look with the text. And for me, the essay form is um, um, uh, the genre uh, par uh, excellence of that autological mode, right? The the the. The, the form of description that ends up performing that which it sets out to describe. Um, the nine chapters, the short chapters, the nine chapters of the book are birds, wealth, caves, television, demons, migrations, love, the sun, and Mormons. Um, and I'm happy to talk about uh, any one of those chapters, but um, I think as far as, you know, laying out the book, laying out my relationship to the book, laying out my relationship to the book that seeded the book, the Popol Vuh, um, I've said about enough, um, and I will hand it over um, very gratefully uh, to uh, Robin. And, I, and if anybody has any questions about the Popol Vuh, just points of clarification, explication, I'm happy to, to go in any direction. Thanks. Thanks so much. That was uh, riveting. Um, and I'm really excited to hear how Robin and Ignacio respond. Um, before I let uh, Robin speak, uh, let me do my duty here and, and respond to um, uh, int introduce him. Um, so Robin Rod is Associate Professor of Anthropology at uh, Duke Kunshan University. Uh, his career began as an anthropologist studying with the Piorora Pia, Pia communities in southern Venezuela where he was interested in the use of uh, psychoactive plants, uh, as well as local theories and practices of knowledge, mind, uh, power and health. So he focused on the ways that consciousness uh, practices associated with the consumption of Yopo snuff and, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, Venisteriopsis carpi, where uh, was socially transmitted and integrated into everyday community life. And he then went on to examine the ritual practices and theories of selfhood associated with ayahuasca use in Australia. Uh, his current work focuses on the relationship between democracy and authoritarianism uh, and citizenship and memory in Argentina and Uruguay. Broadly speaking, he's interested in how democratic or authoritarian subjectivities are produced, sustained and come undone. Uh, this work emerges out of conversations among anthropology, Latin American studies and critical theory, uh, and especially political theology. 
A representative example of, his, of, uh, of this work is his recent article in the Journal of Iberian and Latin American Research, The Banality of, Eagle, uh, the Bana Banality of Evil, Nunca Mas, and the Implicated Subject in Argentine Memory Spaces. Uh, so we're very grateful to Robin for joining us, especially because he is uh, a self-avowed non-expert in the Popol Vuh, uh, because he, uh, he's going to ask the kind of questions that other non-experts like me want to ask but are too afraid to, um, and, and he'll give us so much more as well. So uh, let me hand it over to Robin. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Tristan, for a lovely introduction, and thanks, um, Ben, for also for hosting this and for, for the opportunity to read um, your wonderful book, Edgar. So, uh, yeah, I am a, a generalist in many ways, and um, I have um, observations, and they might lead to a couple of questions, and I, I don't want to speak for too long, but I want to say that for someone who knew nothing about the Popol Vuh, reading this incredibly short and, and lucid book gave me a sense of its unique, the, the historical specificity in which it was written, and also the, the, its radical contemporaneity. I mean, that there is a sense that this book is um, very meaningful for our time, and, and the, the way that you've written it opens up to many different um, contemporary applications or possibilities or questions that it encourages us to ask. So I think that's um, re remarkable. So there's a couple of uh, points, I suppose, that that spoke to me or that came out of the book that I, I want to raise that I think they're, um, that, that move through different parts of the work. And one is this sense, and, and, they, and they all really, <clears throat> Uh, well, what is the sense of, of crisis um, that the book encourages us to rethink crisis, not as events, um, but as a process and, and in fact, perhaps an ongoing process, but crisis in the long durée. And I think, um, and linked to this, uh, well, certainly colonial violence is a, that, that colonial violence should be considered to be an ongoing process, that it's something from the, the historical moment that the Popol Vuh was written, but it very much informs our time now. And in many ways, people continue to think of colonial violence or the colonial process as a historical artifact rather than an ongoing process. So I think there's a very, you know, a, a potency in, 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 in the way that you've poetically raised that point. Um, but also in, in the way that the book tacks between representations of crisis in the sense that it structures the way that the Popol Vuh uh, was, was written by in this dialogue um, between colonists and Mayans, that is the representation and the subjectivities of crisis. And I think this is really interesting because crisis is often dealt with in terms of representations of crisis and not so much in terms of um, the subjectivities. But this, but this, but your account in the way that you bring in, you know, vignettes, the, the experiences of contemporary people in different moments, just little images, um, it really does a nice job there. I mean, reading your book was amazing because it landed on my desk at a time that there were other books on my desk, right? So I it just, it just as, a, as a happenstance, right? I, I make connections to the other books that happen to be on my desk, but one of them is A Crisis Under Critique, an edited volume by Axel Honneth and, and Didier Fassin, um, which, which is concerned with thinking about the multiplicity of crisis, um, the multiplicity of ways that people interpret live through, respond to crisis. Um, but I think one thing that, that your book does that none of the various case studies in that book does is deal with this incredible temporal aspects of crisis and, and force us to reframe thinking about temporality in relation to crisis. So beyond crisis, the other theme for me that really resonates in your book is, is the notion of temporality, the multiple temporalities the relationship of different temporalities, the, the politics of time um, and possibility and the way that the politics of crisis relate to the politics of time. 
Um, and there was a, a moment in, in, in your book where I think you referred to the Popol Vuh as an instrument for um, an instrument for seeing the future. <laughs> it, it refers to itself that way. Yes, right, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that this is, um, uh, yeah, it's a very powerful, I mean, it's, it's a very powerful uh, concept, right? A tool that can reveal um, the future. But in terms of the way that, uh, that that it deals with these notions of of rupture and continuity. You were talking about the the um, you know the recursive aspects. The other term that that you used at one point. I mean, I love all these terms. The shakiness. Um, you know, the dialectics that don't re that do not reduce the synthesis, but that continue to 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 comply with multiplicity and difference. Um, uh, but that there's something about the, the 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 temporal logic of crisis and the politics of time itself, which it can encourage you know, creative uh, um, openings. I think is um, is is really fruitful um, for using this book to think about um, you know. The two overarching crises that are in my head, which is you know the the, the environmental disaster, uh, and and ongoing radical you know social inequalities, um, and this takes me to the third point I bring out of your book, which is about language, because in the opening sequence, in the opening, um, we're talking about the the power of. Um, you know, the, uh, that the gods were disappointed with the humans who created animals uh, because the animal, the animal song, their, their, their communication was perfect. It was just a pure expression. There was no, you know, symbolic duplicity or this, these multiple levels. Um, uh, but, but for them, um, so th th this was this was not a correct way of seeing that what's at stake with language is is a is to 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 enable a correct way of seeing. So this connection of the right language in order to come to terms with the crisis, the emergence, right, which is all contingent on this shakiness, or you know, as you end the book, maybe, <laughs> but um, so. Uh, I think this is really, I mean, this for me hits so many, you know, works that are struggling with the correct way of seeing in a world that is fraught by incredible crisis, right? The, the emergence of Gaia into our, and into our realities, right? the new climatic regime, whatever one wants to talk about this, where I think, you know, Tocqueville put it, for him, there weren't even the concepts to make sense of democracy out of his political theory, right? So that how can we describe something if we don't know what it is? And this has led to this, you know, explosion in speculative um, uh, writing about reality and also new visual ways. Um, but I think the temporal aspect here um, is, is uh, yeah, again, um, thinking about language to conceive of these temporal ruptures is really interesting. So um, to reduce <laughs> all of my three points, I think there's super, super interesting way of thinking about crisis, temporality, and language, and the relationship between the complexities of these three that you open in this book in really cool ways. I have a specific question about um, Going back to the language, animals, humans, because I'm struck with the similarities in, in Amazonian cosmology and in Amazonian creation stories, but I'm also uncertain as to how far those similarities go and if there's actually something quite different here about how meaning is understood in relation to language. Um, because I think at one point you said that people sing in order to be 
um, or, or people perform poetry in an attempt to become close to animals, to achieve the perfection of communication of animals, the elegance, the, the, the and it is the opposite in, in, in my understanding in, in Amazonian contexts where people sing in order to differentiate themselves from animals. But there's something about this, this, this animal, symbol, human, um, song, language, right? A nexus here about becoming like or differentiating that I find really interesting. And, and again, as someone who knows nothing about um, Mayan cosmology, I, I might be um, completely missing this. Um, but, but there's something interesting here about the way that humans think about making their own identities through communication and how they conceive of symbols in that in relation to animals, especially given the centrality of animal communication and communication with animals in these um, Amerindian cosmologies. So I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the way that this communication across um, species is, is, uh, is, is reflected in, in, the, in the Pobulva itself. And, um, and I know you've worked on, on these questions um, at length uh, in other places. And I, 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 I bought your, your first book, which I look forward to reading. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's all I have to say now, but I, I um, enjoyed it so much, your book. That's so generous and generative. Thank you. I have so much to say, but should I say or should I wait? Do you, do you want to respond quickly to Robin now? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know if I can do it quickly because there's so much there, but I will do my best to do it concisely. Um, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, contemporaneity of the book has two forms for me, um, uh, or, or two casts for me. Um, uh, uh, one cast is um, its literal contemporaneity in contemporary Mesoamerican Maya indigenous rights movements. Uh, which I discuss, I think, in the second chapter, uh, where um, the figures of the book are, um, to this day, uh, used to think about uh, uh, various bad political actors in the Mexican state, in the Guatemalan state, right? So uh, the EZLN has famously com <coughs> compared the Mexican Supreme Court to one of the villains of the Popo Vu, um, the Mexican police to another villain, uh, so on and so forth. And you see this in, 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 in Mexico, you see it in Central America. Uh, so that's one cast of the contemporaneity of the book. It's, it's living this into the present moment as a way of uh, thinking through uh, political emergency. Uh, the other way, and, and, and what I think enables that uh, is that you're absolutely right that crisis in the book is not, um, um, I don't even know if this is a real word, but I, I, I read Marshall Solon's use it once, evenimental, is that, you know, evenimental, like, you know, uh, right, like that it's not evenimental, right, but that it's recursive, that it's not, as you're saying, event-oriented, but it has this kind of repetition to it that on the one hand is reflective of the repetitions of colonial violence, uh, which continue not only to the present moment, but that cascade through the uh, uh, experience, right? Cascade all the way through the experience of living on the hemisphere today amidst political and environmental crisis, right? So one example of this is that um, um, it used to be the case, right? When my family migrated to the United States, uh, from Central America, Guatemala and El Salvador uh, in the 70s. Uh, uh, it used to be the case that migration was city to city, right? primarily, right? San Salvador to LA, Guatemala City to Chicago, Mexico City to New York, so on and so forth. There was a city to city migration pattern. Um, in the last 15 to 20 years, that has completely changed because of the devastation, environmental devastation of farmlands, right? um, uh, because people in rural areas can no longer grow uh, the food they need to survive the migration now is rural to urban. So you're having a much larger 
group of indigenous migration to the United States. Mom, Maya language, uh, uh, was the ninth most spoken language in US immigration courts in 2019 or 2018, something like that. Uh, more so even than French, right? There are three Mayan languages in the top 25 uh, most spoken languages in US immigration courts. Right? This is a pattern um, that is you know, a, a, a key feature of this kind of repetitious nature of colonial violence where right? it wasn't in the past, right? History is not back there, it's right here. Right? It's right in front of us. If you know, you kind of like um, uh, uh, just have to open your eyes and look. And what I find really amazing about the Popovu is that it sees all this, right? That it knows all this, and that it has a structure, right? um, narrative, right? narratological, um, uh, and poetic uh, for engaging. Right, where uh, scenes of decision are never back there; they're always in front of you. They're always available for reconfiguration, reorganization, uh, reconceptualization, uh, change. Um, it can be a, a somewhat frustrating book to read at times because of uh, how many names get repeated, right? Names, you know, uh, uh, who are apparently, you know, the same people, but not the same people um, uh, arriving to very similar situations and they have to make the decision anew. And it's, um, uh, 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 in, it's somewhat hard for a uh, a first reader to keep track of where in time we are in the book, right? Um, where in time we are in the book uh, with relation to when creation happened and when the sun is coming into existence. But I think that that's part of this kind of non evenimental um, uh, conception of emergency that it has, right? This kind of recursive conception um, uh, of emergency. Um, um, uh, uh, one last thing that I want to say, because I know that uh, um, uh, I know that at least Ignacio wants me to talk about it, uh, so I'll just kind of jump right on and talk about it. Is the last chap chapter on Mormons, right? So, what is was there a chapter on Mormons uh, and Mormonism uh, in a, 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 a book about the Popol Vuh? Uh, uh, well, it's there because it ties exactly into this recursive structure of dealing with problems, um, uh, as you may or may not know. No reason why you should. Um, 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 Mormons believe right, that one of the lost or a couple of the lost tribes of Israel made it to the Americas right, uh, and became either the indigenous peoples of the Americas wholesale or a particular subset of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. This is a, you know, a belief in the Book of Mormon. Um, and if you read the Book of Mormon closely, uh, there are very specific um, geographical markers uh, that, uh, you know, like there's gotta be water here and there's gotta be water this far away from it. And it takes this long to travel from here to there uh, that you know, basically allow a careful reader to narrow um, the location of the Book of Mormon with all these Lamanites and Nephites and Jaredites to one of two places, right? uh, either the Great Lakes, right, where I live now, kind of Chicago, Great Lakes area, or um, uh, uh, the, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, Mesoamerica. Why it can't be the Great Lakes is because uh, um, uh, the Book of Mormon relates what, like a 4,000 year history without ever once mentioning snow or ice. Can't write a story about Great Lakes without, <laughs> without at least experiencing snow or ice once, let alone a new year where it's hot, right? This is another thing. There's a new year celebration where it's hot. So, you know, a lot of Mormons believe that the Book of Mormon takes place in Mesoamerica, and there's deep investment in Mormon archaeology and some of the best archaeologists, some of you know really great anthropologists, very careful scholars of Mesoamerica are Mormons. Right? So there's this implication of Mormonism in Mesoamerica. Right? There's a a, 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 a kind of um, um, uh, intensity of attention in Mormonism on Mesoamerica and a deep commitment um, uh, to convert uh, Mayans to Mormonism. What is the, what, you know, what's the flip, right? What's the kicker? How does the, you know, so what, what does that matter? Uh, well, as it turns out, Mayas are very savvy uh, about, um, you know, again, the recursivity of creation, uh, the um, uh, non evenimental nature of, of history and time. Uh, so 
uh, and, and that chapter is about the study, uh, or you know, portion of that essay is about this study that was made in the 1990s of Mayan Mormons who say, okay, right, Mayan converts to Mormonism who say, okay, if this is the Mormon story, right, that you know we are the original peoples, then that means that our book, the Popol Vuh, is the original book, right, and the Mormons of the North are the latter day converts to a Maya way of being. <laughs> That's, you know, like, you know, the, if, if we follow the story of the Book of Mormon logically and straightforwardly, uh, it can be flipped right, based on this kind of like non-evenimental, recursive, repetitious, um, um, somewhat tricksterish um, uh, um, um, ability uh, to return to scenes of creation, to reconfigure, recast, and rework them. Um, 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 yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of a long-winded way to kind of further dramatize the strange contemporaneity of the Popol Vuh and why it um, uh, uh, can be a deeply frustrating book. Right? Um, there's a couple of moments uh, uh, towards its end where it um, uh, 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 tries to recast the terrible, uh, viciously violent warlord um, um, Tonatiu Pedro Alvarez uh, as something like, uh, you know, a new god or something, or, you know, tries to cast it and absorb it into a Maya cosmology that I find painful and you know, like non-satisfying to read. Uh, but there are these other moments like this kind of flip of Mormon studies upon itself and turning it into Mayan studies that is exactly the same thing, you know, um, uh, uh, redone and, you know, uh, uh, retested. So yes, contemporaneity, subjectivities of crisis, that's all uh, 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 in there and, and, and time. Um, I, and, and I'll stop there. I can, I'll say more about um, language and animals in a bit, but I, you know, I really, I think I've talked quite a bit now for as just kind of a first pass response. That's great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Edgar. Um, let me uh, turn over the microphone to Ignacio Carvajal, um, I'll just briefly introduce. He's Assistant Professor of Spanish and Comparative Literature um, at the University of California, San Diego, a position he's just taken up. Congratulations, uh, Ignacio. Um, prior to this, he was Assistant Professor in the Humanities and Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Kansas. Um, Ignacio uh, obtained a PhD in Latin American Literatures and Cultures from the University of Texas at Austin, and where Really delighted to have Ignacio join us because his research is precisely in the space uh, that Edgar's book occupies. So uh, Ignacio researches on indigenous responses to colonialism and evangelization during the early colonial period, as well as, <coughs> excuse me, pedagogical approaches to indigenous language learning, especially uh, Kiche. In fact, he's created the first open resource uh, online course on, um, on Maya Kiche called Let's Learn Kiche. It does have another title, which I believe is In Kiche, and I'm not going to embarrass myself enough to try and pronounce that. Um, Ignacio can do that for us in a minute, perhaps. Uh, but Ignacio is also um, interested in broader questions in, uh, in Central American literatures and cultures, uh, in poetry, in translation and digital humanities. Now, he's also a writer and translator of poetry himself. Uh, he has two books of poetry, in fact. Um, the first uh, is uh, uh, Plegarias, um, which was published in 2017 by the University of Houston and Casa Cultural de las Americas. And uh, it's an award-winning book, it won first place in the um, Poetic Bridges Continental Contest. So congratulations, Ignacio. Uh, and he has a more recent book of poetry out entitled Allow a Litany, um, published by La Resistencia Press in 2021. So let me um, thank uh, Ignacio again, and uh, and we look forward to hearing uh, your comments. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Edgar, and thank you, Robin, so far, and thank you, everybody who's here for taking the time. Um, we were talking a few minutes before the event started that some of us are on Wednesday and some of us are on Tuesday, and really, we're all over the world. So I really appreciate everybody coming in from the place and time that they are here. Hi, Oscar, nice to see you. I'm glad that you could make it. And uh, thank you everybody for organizing this event. Thank you, Edgar, for uh, writing this book. Um, it was really interesting to hear some of the, sort of the bigger questions that I was gonna pose uh, of the motivation and how did you think about it? Uh, why did you write it? You know, the Popol Vuh um, 
there's so much scholarship on the Popol Vuh that you always wonder, here's another book on the Popol Vuh. What, what is it this time, right? And uh, I really appreciated, especially this logic of the, that you just described that was really helpful for me to hear of looking at it internally, right? And sort of foregoing that sort of um, um, uh, scholarly objectivity um, that, that you mentioned. And so, and I'll do a correction to the, to the bio really quickly because I don't wanna take credit for creating the first ever open access um, that's a very team uh, oriented project uh, with collaborators in Guatemala and in the United States and is a, a compilation of um, uh, language learning lessons that uh, have grammatical and vocabulary and uh, audio files that you can listen to 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 get the basics of Kiche. So I wouldn't want to take credit by, uh, for, uh, for a project that's very much beyond myself. Um, um, but yeah, so what I've done is just prepared a few remarks and, uh, in the interest of me not rambling, I'm going to just read them. Um, uh, and, and then I've prepared a couple of questions, some of which Edgar already knows, and maybe just that one new one that has come up as we have spoken. Um, and then we can, um, just move to the questions or discussions, um, to close out. Uh, thank you again all for being here. Uh, in reading Edgar Garcia's Emergency, I am most immediately struck by the connection between the timeless and timely contents of the Popol Vuh and the immediacy of our present moment, which folks have already mentioned, right? Uh, health crises, assailing dis-ease and unease, political transformation. In Emergency, a long arc links writers engaged in compiling the original Popol Vuh, their descendants in the early 18th century when Jimenez transcribed it, and authors such as Humberto Acabala and Luis de Leon. It links Bukup Kakish significance to the declarations of Yunche and the Lacandon jungle. It links the underworld departure to migration into the United States. It links the visual and sonic aspects of the Popol Vuh to some of its cinematographic appearances, including its vocal rendition by Teatro Campesino. It connects the surveillance of extirpation campaigns in the 16th and 18th centuries to the CIA World Factbook. All these connections share space in asking a question of crisis. In all of the essays the Popol Vuh and other cultural objects analyze are putting forward a question about how to make sense of the world. Garcia writes that emergency is at the heart of the motivation for writing the Popol Vuh and that, and I quote, such emergency only seems to animate the necessity of the Popol Vuh in its aim to translate crisis to creativity. And you've already very eloquently spoken about that moment of transition of stories that have been part of uh, broad and diversely politically applied traditions in the Maya world as it becomes sort of fixed in this alphabetical form in the 16th century, right? And then reiterated in the 18th. I additionally appreciate the perspective that offered on what crisis means in its 16th century moment, its 18th century moment, its 20th century moment, in today's moment. The reminder Garcia tells us explicitly is that, and here's another quote, crisis is rarely imagined with the depth that might cut a ravine across a deep past from 1555 to 1702, or cut into the present moment from 1555 to 1984, focus, fo forcing us to ask about present emergencies in terms of longer emergency that is colonial transplantation. And again, I think this is very much already in line with sort of what folks have already observed and, and, and asked about. In the chapters that were circulated, Garcia sees this crisis, this emergency of religious imposition as manifested first in evangelization, the root of, uh, uh, of the, even the alphabetization of the Popol Vuh to begin with. Also revealed in the story of Seven Maka or uh, Wukub Kakish, the self-aggrandizer, he sees the notion of primitive accumulation, that the cosmogenesis if leading to the aggrandizement of the few and detriment of the many needs to be questioned. As he puts it, if those myths sustain only a small few, enabling exceptional greed, the many have the responsibility to revise the cosmogenesis. Garcia even backgrounds the notion of territorial claim in the middle of the 16th century to highlight what he interprets as an affirmation of the centrality of maize in the political encyclical order, which was one of the questions that I actually wanted to ask you about. And you've already spoken to a little bit about the sort of, you know, bringing back of maize as the thing that allows, right? And, and how this really repeats over and over. 
the rest of the chapters cover an expansive set of cultural objects uh, from Werner, Werner Herzog films to Scottish translations of Piche language poetry. But there are two main things that I want to point to in this book as my role as a discussant here today. And, and the first is about language sort of along those same lines that Robin was talking about. The poetic aspects of language that are present in the book, um, they also form a layer throughout it, beginning from the very first pages with the Whippoorwill and its English name and its Kiche onomatopoeia, continuing to the title's multiplicity of the word emergency, uh, the cycle of the holy crop maize appearing even in the corn syrup and the soft drink mentioned in one of the poems. And uh, some of what I most dwelled on as I read this book was that, tri that triangulation, I guess, uh, with English specifically, and what that means about the book's endeavor and our endeavor as readers and thinkers as well. And just as a representative example of what I mean, I want to offer uh, this short excerpt where you are writing about uh, the Kiche diplomat going and bringing the book uh, to, to the king, uh, to the king's court. And so um, the word court here in English, right? Court, corte in Spanish, but, all, but not courts like a ball court. That is a different word in Spanish, uh, uh, um, a campo, right? And so I'll read the excerpt. excerpt. I wonder if the Quiche diplomat Cortes saw, this, saw his situation mirror in the, in the story of the Popol Vuh, like the hero twins, he was headed for a court that controlled so much death. It had brought warfare and disease to the highlands, and it had spread its morbid dominion in all directions. Who were these lords of death, and how could he redeem his forebears? And I think that speaks really beautifully to sort of the cyclical nature that you've been speaking about, but also specifically about what I really saw happening in the book throughout, which is this, this triangulation of language uh, that, that was very productive for me. So that's something that I want to speak to. And then the second thing is that there's hope in the book, recurring words like revolution, restitution, regeneration, the triumph of those who have less, the gift of corn as renewal, but not a mere repetition of wretched conditions. I certainly share your curiosity when, and this is a quote, I wonder still why these gods bother with anything more after making the birds. Uh, but really what comes through much more in the book for me, and I would ask you whether that's to your joy or to your dismay, I got is a message that invites us to question what to do in crisis uh, from a place of creativity and creation, an invitation to wonder how will the sewing be, how the donning. And so that's just my little response that I wrote about it that um, sort of touched on the main points of what I saw in the book. And I'll go ahead and say the questions that I have. And if they prompt your question as a listener, uh, you know, feel free to drop something in the chat that's, that speaks to it, that, and that way Edgar might be able to speak to one or two things um, uh, at one time. So I sort of have broader ones and smaller ones. Um, one that I've already, um, one that's really specific is about the concept of pus. That is, by the time I sent you that question, I had read only a few of the chapters, but it's really actually in most of the chapters, the reference back to pus. And um, pus is a, is a very specific word that appears in the Popol Vuh and it gets all these different translations. It's translated to power, it's translated to divinatory power, to transforming power, to authority, depending on whose translation you're reading. So it was something that called my attention a lot. Um, and so um, you really describe it in different moments of uh, one time you say the poetry, uh, the pools of poetry and critique, or the ability to break things open, or the ability to see right, sort of with this il balch, this, this seeing instrument. And so if there is time, I just was personally curious and very intrigued by how you arrived at that concept, how you identify it, how you sort of wield it throughout the book uh, and what we should understand by it. But maybe that's too specific of a question. So I'll just plant that seed so that maybe you can answer it someday for me. But the other questions that I had um, are sort of a little bit broader. Um, uh, one of them is uh, the relationship between the colonial project and the word transplantation, specifically as it appears in the book. I see it in places where I usually see words like conquest or conversion or invasion or empire making. Um, and I even saw it contrasted to something like overgrowth, I think was the word in one of the moments. And I, it made me think about fugitivity. Uh, and it was very creative. It, it, it brought up a lot of things in my mind. And I just wondered if there was some type of larger underpinnings to the word transplantation and if you would speak to that. And then finally, maybe this is the one to start with and the sort of most broad one, which is so much of the book 
compares and contrasts these moments, these myths, these narratives, these creation stories to other foundational cultural content from from places, right? And um, I would love to hear a, a little bit more. You know, they they're stories sometimes. Sometimes they're foundational creation myths. Uh, sometimes they're other sort of tenets of what we might very broadly conceive as Western philosophies, right? And so in speaking about, especially with how you led the beginning of saying, people aren't convinced that this is literature or people aren't convinced that this is sort of worthy uh, philosophical thought and, right? And, and this is sort of the, 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 the big colonial curse, right? Which is for so long, it created regimes of knowledge that excluded folks. And then as a response, a lot of us uh, have, have sort of come to affirm Oh, these types of knowledges, these creation stories, these epistemologies are just as good as Western uh, as Western epistemologies. They're just as valid, right? And uh, I think, especially in like critical indigenous studies, and more and more voices come and say, "Well, why is the measuring stick this one? Why do why do you have to tell me that the Popolu is just as valid as the Bible for me to find uh, its sort of validity through uh, a Western, nonetheless, comparison, right?" And so. I just wondered because the book does so much uh, in in placing it really so broadly throughout the world that I was really interested in what you might say about that question specifically. Um, so those are the questions and the comments that I had about it. I really enjoy reading it, and uh, I'm grateful that I had the chance to participate in this with y'all. Um, and I'll leave it for Edgar to um, choose. And if you need me to repeat a question or something like that, I'm happy to. Right on, man. I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, you really moved me with your um, uh, participation inside the book, uh, and really, uh, you know, also looking from inside it out. Um, uh, um, in terms of its comparative framework, uh, what I don't want to do uh, is to say this is on par with that. This is concomitant with that. This is equivalent to that. What I want to say, and this is. Um, um, one of the hardest things when I teach the Popo Vu to undergrads is to get them to understand how powerful it is, right? That it's actually more powerful than they can even reckon with, that it has already taken them into account, thought past them, and offered frameworks for seeing beyond themselves. Um, they often are very scared right? Uh, because they arrive with a kind of unreconstructed uh, sense of what an indigenous text is, right? So they're very scared to say anything critical or something possibly harmful or whatever about it. Um, um, uh, uh, I mean, some students, you know, I'm, I'm talking for the majority of my students, some just don't know that discourse, but for the most part, the students kind of feel, oh, we don't want to do damage to this text. And one of the biggest challenges is to get them to understand you can't do anything to the Popo Vu, right? Like the Popo Vu is like, it's way more like this, you know, you can't do anything to Popo Vu in the same way you can't do anything to Ovid, right? You, you, you know, the thing has considered you, will outlast you, so on and so forth. And so what I do to get them to understand this notion and what the book is uh, a kind of um, dramatization of is I'll have them, once we've read through the Popo Vu, uh, uh, take a concept from it and use that concept to explain a work of non-Western literature. Like, tell me something, you know, read Dante with the Popo Vu, right? But tell me something about Jane Austen that you would not have otherwise known about, you know, without the Popo Vu, right? Read a film, right? read Herzog with the Popo Vu, right? Because for me, that is the bigger shift, right? It's not like putting things on par, but giving a, an object privilege of place, privilege of intellectual, philosophical space. Um, when I was coming through grad school, it was the case, and it may still be the case. I, you know, I think maybe things are a little different now, but you know, I, I think the tendency somewhat remains, uh, is to think of um, um, non-Western, minoritized, indigenous, subaltern, or otherwise peripheralized works of literature and art as content to be interpreted by Western European form. Right? That's just the framework. That's you know how those works are supposed to be viewed. And I found that deeply frustrating. Uh, and what I have tried to do in my research and writing, right, and, and, and the kind of um, um, work that I have tried 
to accomplish is to flip that paradigm and take these works as form, right? um, the popo vu as form by which to interpret the world, right? By which to interpret, you know, Western works, non-Western works, to do cross indigenous, trans indigenous um, um, uh, interpretations, um, um, uh, to uh, do like, you know, indigenous Western, to do, you know, hemispheric American, um, um, uh, you get what I'm saying. And I think that a lot of this is motivated by the fact that like, I, I'm Central American, okay, but I'm not Central American. I'm Central American American. <laughs> like I was, you know, I'm an American who's Central American. Right? And so I've got a very mixed up and complicated relationship to not only Central America and the historical legacies of civil war and my own family's need to disconnect because a bunch of my family died in those wars, right? And the, and the need to, you know, and their need to disconnect and my desire to reconnect and how that's like complicated by growing up in a predominantly Mexican neighborhood, right? And so I'm Central American, but Mexican, Mexican, but not. And then, you know, suddenly there are all these like Colombians and Venezuelans now. And it's like, you know, this, this um, heterogeneity of, um, frameworks, uh, I think, has compelled me to, you know, think in that, in those kinds of triangulations that you're talking about, right? English, Spanish, Kiche, English, Spanish, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe, Kiche, English, Spanish, right? Like these kinds of like other um, uh, crystallizations of, um, of, 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 of how we even conceptualize work, of, uh, the work of the Americas, right? And not, and this is something that I have tried to resist, and not always just to um, naturalize the um, Spanish interface, right? Um, <laughs> not to think is like, you know, that, that like the Spanish interface is somehow the, uh, the, the post-colonial emancipatory, so on and so on, because of course it's not, right? Like, but I think in, American, Latino, Latinx, Latin America, so that is kind of weirdly the, the framework, and that's not at all, that does not seem to me um, uh, um, 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 appropriate. Um, um, I'm glad that Oscar is here, <laughs> uh, 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 because this answer is directly for Oscar. It's for everybody, but it's for Oscar. Um, uh, Oscar is an amazing astrologer. Uh, and uh, um, uh, and I've had some really brilliant, amazing astrological sessions with Oscar, uh, and I'm just going to say that uh, right now, straight up, uh, that ha uh, that have been mind blowing and have let me see uh, some of what it is that I'm doing with my own uh, work. Um, and um, uh, in terms of motivation, um, I can sit here and I can tell you all. Oh, I wrote this book because of all these philosophical frameworks, and I had these books, or whatever, and this and that. Um, and I, you know, have even said this uh, when I've given these kinds of presentations in the past. And at one, in one moment, I was pushed on it by a scholar of divinity, uh, like a religious studies scholar at Wake Forest. And I was like, "Oh, but why did you write the book?" And I was like, "Oh, because I had these books in my house." You no, know, why did you write this book now? Oh, because emergency. No, why did you write this book? And I said. Sometimes the gods just don't let you go, right? And I swear to you, 100%, this is not fiction, fabrication of any kind or sort. At that moment that I said that, all our cell phones buzzed in the room and the alarms on the campus went off because a tornado was coming, right? And we had to go down into the, and I, and I, and I realized like, you know, there are some things that you can't touch lightly. Right? Uh, and there are some things that I don't have answers for. Right? And there are some things that are, you know, beyond me, behind me, and also in front of me that are pulling me and pushing me. And for sure, ancestry is one, right? But I don't even know how to conceptualize that, right? My ancestors are here, but they're, you know, they're not here. Um, um, and I'm just working towards that in ways that are still completely mystified to me. Oscar has helped me to see some of that, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a trip. It's it's difficult, and it's and and it's and and it's a challenge to write in that vein, and also, you know, um, um, stay serious, right? Stay 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 um, close to the text, right? Uh, stay close to the history and to the historiography, 
And um, I've, 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 that's what I set out to do with the book, right? um, to, to try to find a way to, to be in, you know, to be balanced in, um, um, in, all, in all that. Um, the, 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 the book, as you and I have both now mentioned, calls itself an instrument for sight. And then I think it proceeds to implicitly describe itself as one of three kinds of instruments for sight. I don't talk about this in the book. It's kind of implicit in my book, but you know, I'll just lay it out here. And that's the lamp, the window, or the mirror. Um, and I think it kind of moves back and forth from being a lamp, source of illumination, being a window, a framework, right? Framework. Um, uh, these are just my, that, this is my translation. Um, uh, or a mirror, right? A, a source for self-reflection. And um, in, in, in various moments, right? I try to do that one two, three, one, two, three, in the book, right? Um, it, as being inside of it, as being inside of the kind of philosophical framework of the book. Uh, to kind of hook back to um, um, Robin's point of like, sometimes you read books alongside other books that just happen to be on your desk. This summer, um, I, I've, I've had a couple of bad health issues. I'm okay, but I've just not been entirely well. I also, my family just had a little baby, so it's very exhausting. So I've, I've not, I've, my reading power has been very limited, but I've read two books this summer. Um, um, one is uh, Chadwick Allen's Earthworks Rising, um, um, and the other is Vico's New Science, right? Or, you know, I'm still working through Vico's, so, but those are the two books for the summer. And they seem very similar to me in one important way, um, and that is a like a, like a like a obsession with the surface, right? Uh, Chadwick Allen's point is that um, uh, in this book about earthworks, he's a literary scholar, and his point in it uh, about Indian mounds, indigenous earthworks of North America, um, uh, is that archaeology has been has has been the wrong framework by which to understand earthworks. That literary studies was very counterintuitive. Literary studies is the framework by which to understand earthworks because literary studies sees earthworks in the present and on the surface. Right? Uh, it doesn't presume to dig out a secret. Right? It doesn't presume to like you know objectively disinter what's hidden inside. No, because it's all here. Right? It's all there. Um, and uh, uh, and again, just by sheer force of accident, Vico seems very similar in the, in, in 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 his. In his approach to um, um, to Roman history, or whatever. Um, um, so yeah, that's you know, <laughs> that's kind of just me. Now, now I'm riffing. Uh, now I'm, I've gone to the kind of side, uh, but it it is all to respond to you uh, uh, by saying that um, the colonial project is not for me in the past, um, um, and it does not seem to be in the past for the Popol Vuh. It seems to be in front of the Popol Vuh. And for me, the colonial project is in front of me. And therefore, the you know um, scene for reconfiguration, recasting, revisualization is in front of me. And that is what I have tried to do in so many moments, in so many ways, in a very short book, right? Because it's not a very long book. It's, you know, um, um, it's, a, it's a collection of, of, of of, of essays. And I have to say, your course also helped me with my quiche. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, among other things, but yeah, so. Oh, and the thing about poots, this is just like, this is like the technical weeds here. A lot of my analysis about poots comes from Dennis Tedlock um, and his, um, um, not even just work on the Popol Vuh, but his um, 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 anthropological conversations around the contemporary idea of Putz as um, being involved somehow with the scene of sacrifice, right? And especially like the cutting open of an animal or a gift or something, which to me in this um, mode that I'm in when I'm reading the Popol Vuh of finding frameworks for analysis seems to me to be about splitting things apart, right? Breaking things open, um, opening things up. Right? That, so that's how I, interpret Poots. Um, um, for people who want to take a still deeper dive into the Popol Vuh, there's a great new book by Nathan Hen called Decolonizing the Popol Vuh or Decol do you know what's the name of that book, Ignacio? Is it like de Decolonial? It's called um, A Decolonial Guide for Reading 
the bubble that's what it's called and, and, yeah. and i think in it he gives like five or six different interpretations of this word boots which is a, a one of like a key term for the popo who along with ilbal so yeah thanks edgar let me hand it over to ben to um lead us through q a yes uh <clears throat> thank you very much um uh, edgar and uh, to 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 rowan and ignacio for, for 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 this extraordinary discussion um about an extraordinary text and my mind uh is swirling um, with with ways of thinking about how to uh, intersect this material with the Greek and Roman world. Um, but instead, what I'll do first of all though is is throw open to the floor before I allow myself to to, to take flight. Um, uh, uh, and we do this by um, either uh, raising your hand in Zoom or placing um, the letter Q in the chat and then, I can uh, I can move from questioner to questioner. So, do we have any do we have anybody who would like to 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 ask a question of any of our guests uh, this this morning? Oh, okay. Um, right. Ah, uh, yes, we have a we have a, a Brant, please. Yeah, I, I'm sort of interested in. Um, the idea that cultures turn to creation stories at times of crisis. Uh, and I just wondered whether that was, whether the, the thought there was that, was that cultures or societies sort of revise or, you know, come up with new creation stories at times of crisis uh, or, um, you know, whether they, you know, but become more wedded to their existing cre creation stories. Is it a is it a is it a conservative uh, is it a conservative movement or a, or a, or a innovative creative sort of response to crisis that that um, yeah that's them. great that's great. So um, this next year. I am teaching a, a co-teaching a um, PhD seminar with a, a, a colleague of mine in early modern studies called Creations, uh, uh, Popol Vuh and Paradise Lost. And um, the aim of the class is to read these historically contemporaneous works, right? Roughly historically contemporaneous works alongside each other, but also as like a like a like a point of divergence or you know separation uh, difference. And uh, one way in which you know the creation uh, in Paradise Lost and um, uh, uh, and in the Popovu seems similar to me is that it is both emancipatory and conservative, right? Uh, it, it wants to, you know, enfold a world back into itself while also, you know, doing so to open up a new possibility for historical reckoning. Uh, to hook back to a point that either Robin or Ignacio made, I can't remember who, I think it was Ignacio, um, about, um, like who is the Popo Vu criticizing anyway? Right? Like what is you know what is this like locus of critique really? Um, for sure, it's um, the colonial interrupter. The Spaniards are just clear and obvious villains of sorts in the Popo Vu, but also um, uh, importantly. Uh, 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 a villain or a, like a, a locus of critique for the Popo Vu is the um, Mayan. Uh, court system, right? Um, the Mayan imperial mode, right? The Mayan imperial mode, which had even before colonialism, it seems, lost sight of that which sustains the maze. Right? Um, the, um, the, the lords of the underworld appear to be stand-ins for a, um, a corrupted and um, um, de deteriorated um, imperial uh, uh, system that is organic, right, to the Americas, just as it's organic to, you know, any, anywhere where, like, you know, like, like power collects um, absolutely or something. Um, 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 so on the one hand, the book wants to conserve something, right, it wants to conserve a Maya way of thinking, an indigenous 
uh, mode of relating, um, a um, uh, you know a, an environmental relation uh, to land, animals, and other people. But on the other hand, it wants to critique right? um, um, the, you know, the like the, the the social structures and the political structures and the political institutions um, that you know it's like you know. Um, 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 that are. So it's both. It's both just as it is for me, at least, you know, I'm not a Milton scholar, just as it is for Milton, right, who's strangely both a Christian and not a Christian, um, um, who's, you know, um, uh, both conservative in some ways and emancipatory in other ways. And, um, and, and, and the creation story, as I see it through the Popol Vuh, right, I'm not a mythologist. I'm not a scholar of folklore. I don't know world mythology you know, tremendously well. Uh, but what the Popol Vuh is, is, is um, a kind of creation story that enables that you know, repetitious sense of creation, that we are constantly coming back to creation, um, that the gods had to do creation multiple times. And that the this is another interesting feature of the Popol Vuh, um, um, that its use of the present tense in um, describing creation suggests that with every enunciation of the text, that creation is being enacted anew. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope that gets at your, your question. Uh, Brooke. Hi, Edgar, hey, Brooke. this is so great. And I'm just buzzing with so much um, admiration and enthusiasm and I think coming back to the book now um, and thinking about it in the context of some thinking I've been doing about cosmology and just other questions has kind of I'm, I'm prefacing this because I feel like I'm not going to be able to ask a very coherent question but one thing um, that really jumped out at me and I was curious it was this idea of cosmology in particular and you know I was thinking and I came on a little bit late so I hope I didn't um, miss anything at the beginning but you know some of my discomfort with ontology and the kind of ontological turn in anthropology and the kind of hermeticism at least of some of the structuralist approaches to that it reminded me when I was thinking of the you know the birds it's almost like they have this completely enclosed world and this vision you have of the gods as sort of critical all of a sudden connected with this idea of cosmology is always rather than there being a reality that's stable and sealed off it was is always being made is always being remade and that that is happening as you were just saying within a society that is critiquing itself and here I think you know I was really thinking of the point that Siraj Ahmed makes in Archaeology of Babel about thinking of layers of colonialism and empire rather than there being one colonial moment and that these struggles are built in already mm. and recursively mm. to the critique of empire. So there's cosmology in the sense of there's always a cosmogonical work, there's always a work happening of rebuilding structures. But then as you, you know, you have the the um the European colonial moment, a different kind of cosmological experimentation that that opens up or that for us where we're situated, we start to see that I think comes out in what you're talking about Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of what my question is, is this idea of cosmological experimentation has been really important as I've been trying to think about the sympathy project and seeing what's happening in the reclamation of sympathy as a site for articulating cosmologies that are Persian or Egyptian or Babylonian, and there being this kind of moment of you know contamination or kind of experimentation around cosmology done in Greek, so to speak, but with all of these different kinds of cosmological systems cross-pollinating. But the thing that, you know, the struggle there is that there's always a power dynamic. And like Ian Moyer has done, I think, really great work on the ways in which sort of Egyptian wisdom traditions are being appropriated, you know, um, in this moment of, of sort of new world making. And I think that's, you know, one of the questions in the back of my mind. Um, is is this you know kind of the million dollar question right of, of appropriation which is i take it that you were sort of alluding to with your students who are a little worried about damaging the poem but there's also this kind of other the other worry is sort of getting carried away with making it one's own in the name of a certain refusal of one's own tainted heritage or a kind of attachment to a, a notion of of a world that one might wish one was born into you know given given um critiques and 
So, you know, I, the question I want to ask is not so much about appropriation, because I think what you were saying about the kind of, you know, the, the <laughs> bulletproof nature of the Pope. I mean, I just love that, you know, like it's so, you know, it's stronger. And then I think that what is amazing about the book is that you're enacting something that is constantly modeling a way to think these texts with one another in this sense that you're not operating on that surface, that these are sort of just tokens of, you know, cultural capital that one is, you know, mobilizing in a power play, but really thinking with in an, in an active way. So that I, what I say, it's hard for me to articulate the question. It's like, in a sense, you've already answered it in the way that the enactment of the book and the way that it invites us to think about comparative ancient studies is there, right? Like it's there as a model. And so to ask you to say, what do you think we should do about comparative antiquities and, you know, the inequities that are, you know, material in all kinds of ways, but most evidently in the allocation of resources in the institution, right? That which ancient languages get studied, you know, mm -hmm. and if it's a zero sum game, you know, and classics departments are going to, you know, keep defending themselves and, and Sanskrit or Kiche and, you know, languages are not being studied. We're not, you know, building worlds around them. So in that even very immediate sense, the power imbalances are there and we have to sort of think about them. Mm -hmm. So my question is like, there's a moment I love this. I have to read it because it's so good. Um, where you say at the end of chapter two, one ethical message here is that those living today are responsible for the myths that sustain them. And if those myths sustain only a few, enabling exceptional greed, the many have the responsibility to revise the cosmogenesis. And I wonder for you, you know, what is like, I feel like we need a new, we, we need to revise our myths of the ancient world, of what antiquity is, of what myths do for living together now um, in ways that are both enacting the kind of cross-pollination, the kind of, you know, promiscuity of the human and world-making that your work is, is doing, while at the same time actively engaging the inequities that have structured how that ancient world is, you know, presented to students, is researched, is is disciplinized, is disseminated, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I have a really big question for you, Edgar. Like, really? how do we? What is you know? What is what are the? How would I translate or how do you see the project of the book, which is a particular form and the essay's particular form, translating into communities of ancient world studies? Sure. So that um, quote, um, which has been now mentioned twice, so I'm, you know, I feel it's resonating, uh, it appears in a chapter that is about uh, indigenous revolutionary movements in Mexico and Central America, uh, 1970s to now. Um, and it appears in relation to um, Marx's notion of primitive accumulation, uh, wherein the you know the the gains of colonialism served to fuel the engines of industry that gave rise to modern life um, uh, the, 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 the you know a new myth of origins for our times um, um, for me uh, what that communicates what that indicates what that uh, enables is um, um, a place a means by which to think about our most um, um, resilient myth, right? Which is the myth of capital itself, right? Uh, the, the, the myth of like capital is somehow self-evidently equitable and progressive, right? Um, like that's a myth, right? and like, but it's, a, it's like, it's, it's a myth by which we live with today in the same way I think that maybe some people live in the belief that like, you know, Mars inspired war at some point, or you know, um, uh, Aphrodite brought people, you know, into lustful relation. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, the, we, uh, uh, you know, kind of without question believe in this myth, and and I think that the Popol Vuh puts all this right, in my reading of the Popol Vuh, all this is cast into 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 question, and that is its real kind of force of comparability, right? Not like just linking this to that, but like how to think critically about all the myths in which we live. Because the Popol Vuh is not in a, um, it doesn't arrive in um, a, a homogenous field of myth, right? Um, it's not just Maya myth that it's working in. It's also Nahuatl myth, 
right? It's also Mexican myth. It's, 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 you know, it's dealing with Mexican myth to the north. It's dealing with some strange array of, you know, like hetero Maya myth to its south. Right? This is not a unified, there's 22 different Mayan languages and, you know, and, and, and various stories of creation going in all directions. And then again, it's dealing with colonial myth, right? So it appears in a field of like mythic, mythological heterogeneity. And rather than say, we are the first, we are the original, we are the, you know, um, uh, the primordial, it says like, we are in this field, right? And this, you know, here in the times of teaching of Christ, here in Christendom, we will tell our story. To me, that's there's a there's a kind of dialectical twist there. There's a kind of self-reflection um, that I just don't see in many creation stories. Right? Maybe it's there in the Bible, or you know, I'm not Robert Graves, so I can't tease it out. But like, you know, like, to me, it's very distinct and powerful and profound to um, um, think about creation um, in dialog dialectical, like self-reflective historiographical um, uh, ways. And that's that's how I teach it. And to me, that's its greatest force for um, impact, um, 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 at least in my little world of the academy um, that I inhabit right? um, every year. Um, so, so the University of Chicago is on a core system, uh, which means that all our undergraduates take, you know, um, streams in the disciplines, humanities core, biological sciences core, social sciences core, so on and so forth. And within humanities core, there's a stream called poetry in the human, uh, um, which is, you know, what is poetry and why do people all the, the world over do this thing? Um, and the Popol Vuh is now on it. Right? And I think it's very impactful for students to read the Popol Vuh alongside and against the Bible, alongside and against the Iliad, alongside and against um, Gwendolyn Brooks, right? um, because it, it, you know, it, it is a way for configuring all those other things um, uh, that to me is um, um, its power um, that, you know, I didn't do that, I, you know, I, I can just help to kind of um, situate and, 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 and maybe explain and, and, and maybe further along. Also, I'm in an English department, <laughs> um, uh, which is, you know, rather, you know, kind of surprisingly enabling, uh, because I don't think that, you know, English has the kind of tensions about this stuff that classics does, right? Um, um, and also, I don't think English has the tensions about this kind of stuff that romance languages and literatures does. Right? Um, I, I think like English is just kind of like, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so um, to kind of, you know, focalize in, in, in different ways. And I know that a lot of people don't like English for that reason and see us as an imperialist discipline. And, you know, we kind of go where we want and all this and that. I understand that. Um, I've been told that. Get it. Um, but for me, it has been enabling to, you know, thereby read um, the Popol Vuh so laterally um, and to think so laterally about uh, a creation story. Well, we've come up to 12.30. Uh, uh, no doubt uh, we, we could actually, I mean, quite easily, I think, carry this discussion on for much longer. But I think uh, it's getting late on Tuesday evening over there. And uh, I think it, it, it remains for us to, to thank um, Edgar and Robin and Ignacio for their extraordinary contributions and uh, uh, stimulating discussion and, and to thank them uh, on behalf of myself and Tristan for participating in our, in our uh, workshop series. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, wonderful book. Um, I have, Lots of things that I could talk about, but I I, I won't uh, I won't uh, uh, bore anybody with those. But I I, I I very much enjoyed it, and I enjoyed this discussion immensely. So thank you.